Please join me welcome Dr. Andy Kuhn. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let me get rid of this first. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, and I'd first like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, here to uh, present our work on uh, ultra-fast science and technology. And the content of this talk is quite different from all the previous talks, uh, because I'll be talking about mainly on uh, laser technology. And uh, I think we have heard from the previous uh, three very beautiful, beautiful talks on uh, the application of attosecond pulses, or ultra-fast uh, pulses, to uh, study the uh, electron dynamics in matter. And uh, what I would like to introduce to you today is a different approach to, uh, <clears throat> a different approach to making attosecond pulses, which uh, I hope will simplify uh, a lot of the experiments that are being done and may broaden the application of uh, these kind of uh, techniques to diff various different laboratories. Uh, in the previous talk, there was, uh, the chairman asked the question of uh, are there alternative techniques to, to, to do rapid? Uh, perhaps uh, you can, if you have a single air to second pulse with a very broad spectrum, uh, there's another way to, to do the uh, measurements perhaps uh, so weak. I would like to stimulate some thoughts and discussions. Okay. Um, so, um, we have heard very beautiful talks on uh, how to, to on nanosecond science, where uh, most of the work has been to elucidate the behavior of electrons in matter this being in a gas phase uh, or in solids. Now, uh, why do we want to understand the behavior of electrons in matter? Because eventually, uh, if we understand that, we can manipulate their the behavior in matter and then uh, give us the opportunity to uh, uh, look into photonics and also uh, atoelectronics, a word is missing here. Now, uh, in order for this to happen, we need to have uh, the right tools. And these tools are the uh, development of attosecond uh, pulses in the last about 20 years. Um, a lot of uh, significant development has happened in the last 10 years. Um, on the other hand, attosecond, uh, attosecond is 10 to minus uh, 18 seconds. It's very difficult. Uh, there's no electronics fast enough for others to produce these pulses. So um, physicists are very smart, okay? Instead of working in the, in the time domain, we work in the frequency domain. If you can produce a spectrum that's very broad, the Fourier transform of that will give you a very short pulse. If the, if the uh, spectrum is a continuous pulse, then it'll give you a single uh, uh, attosecond pulse. If the spectrum is a uh, comb of frequencies, as been, has been described in the previous couple of talks, then you get a train of uh, attosecond pulses. So now, um, the uh, development of uh, very broad spectrum actually started uh, almost the same time as uh, with lasers. As soon as there was a Moloch laser, when people focused the intense, intense uh, pulse into matter, you get a broad spectrum coming out. Um, but more recently, 
in order to get femtosecond pulses, it has been necessary to start with femtosecond pulses. Um, now, um, the conventional approach, there are two approaches. If you have a sufficiently intense laser pulse, for example, uh, several millijoules in, a, in a, uh, tens of femtoseconds, you can focus the light into a, into, the, into a gas phase or squeeze it through a hollow fiber in the order of the, the fiber diameter is in the order of a couple hundred microns, then you can generate, you can generate a broad spectrum. On the other hand, if you only have a Moloch laser oscillator, the pulse energy is in the order of uh, uh, let's say a tenth of a microjoule to at most a microjoule, then you have to rely on using solids, which uh, has a, uh, a thousand times larger linearity, and uh, using that to produce a supercontinuum. Well, what about the, in, the, um, the, the range of air pulse energy in between, from several microjoules to uh, sub millijoule? Okay, uh, this creates has been a void. Uh, it has not been possible the pulse energy or the peak power is not sufficient to generate supercontinuum in the gas phase. On the other hand, it's too powerful to do that in the solids. So uh, that is our uh, driving um, uh, goal to see if there's a solution. Well, let's first of, all, first of all understand what happens when you focus an intense laser light into a solid, okay? Um, in this case, we focused it to an intensity of uh, about 20 times uh, 20 terawatt per square centimeter. And the uh, peak power of the pulse, uh, if the pulse duration is in the order of tens of femtoseconds, um, is uh, several th thousand times of the critical power, critical power being the power for self-focusing. When that happens, the, um, the, the beam, once it enters the material, it focuses very quickly and uh, it will cause damage to the material. And this is typically how uh, uh, laser engraving is being done. Well, if your pulse is short enough, for example, if it's 30 femtosecond pulse, the material actually doesn't da get damaged. The reason for that is if the spectrum is broad enough, okay, um, there's a dispersion in the material, which causes trap. As soon as the pulse, as, as soon as the uh, pulse enters the material, and then the pulse broadens, its peak power drops, and therefore it will not damage. On the other hand, it doesn't do very much because when the peak power drops, it uh, it will not uh, broaden the spectrum of the pulse. And uh, you can see, this is a 500 thick micron thick uh, piece of uh, quartz, and then the spectrum broadens quite slowly. Uh, at the end, you maybe you, you get a spectral broadening of two or three times. You cannot get a super continuum uh, coming out. So, is there a solution? Do we need to stay with the, the low pulse uh, energy for these pulses to generate super continuum? Uh, oh, furthermore, uh, if you do come in with an intense enough pulse, uh, even though you get broadening at the same time, because in reality, every pulse has uh, some fluctuation in, in amplitude or in phase. Uh, you actually get multiple filaments out. You get a white light, but then uh, the spatial quality is very poor. Okay, now, is there a solution? <clears throat> let's consider, instead of having a thick piece of material, let's split it up into several pieces. The thickness of each piece is such that uh, there will be very small amount of uh, dispersion accumulated by the pulse, uh, and then we, uh, we will allow the pulse to come out of the material. After that, uh, there will be self-focusing because of linear phase does get accumulated. It self-focuses, it will then uh, focus to a, to a very tiny spot, but then the pulse defects. After the deflection, it will come back up and then at some point, we'll insert a second piece, third piece, and so on. Let's see how this works. Suppose uh, we start with a pulse whose spectrum is about this big, okay? Uh, the horizontal scale is perhaps, let's say, wavelength. Uh, when the pulse goes through the first piece, it will create some broadening, okay? Some amount of broadening. Uh, the, the, the pulse focuses, broadens, and then I put a second piece there. Uh, 
After the second piece, the, the, there's additional broadening to the pulse, okay? And this happens uh, continuously until at some point it stops broadening. Then I will stop putting in more pieces. Uh, and, uh, and we find that uh, at the point uh, when, when the broadening stops, then you already get white light. And also the spectrum is very nice. Okay, the center part is the super continuum that appears as a white light. Now, uh, you can actually analyze this using the Lonnie Stronger uh, equation uh, of propagation in the, through the material. Now, for this happen, to happen, uh, we have to uh, figure out uh, there are two criteria you have to satisfy. Number one is what is the intensity you can use? or given thickness of the plate. The other one is, how do you determine the spacing between the two plates? What determines it? Okay. Um, by doing the, so, uh, of course, we, we, we all understand that we don't want to come in, come in with an intensity that is large enough so that uh, you, you will damage the material. So that's, uh, and, but, and, but then at the same time, you want to have sufficient intensity so that this, this the spectral broadening, which is, uh, which is uh, mainly caused by, let me come back to this. Uh, the broadening mechanism uh, is mainly caused by cell phase modulation, which gives you a fairly symmetric broadening to the left, to the blue and to the red. At the same time, for super continuum to, to um, happen, there's a second process called cell steepening, which gives you very quickly a expansion of the spectrum towards the blue. So this is a signature of a super continuum. So we want both of these to happen uh, in, in, if we want to have effectively generate a super continuum. Okay, now, um, so, since it's a highly nonlinear uh, process, we do want to apply a high enough intensity for this, for the, for the process to happen. Um, at the same time, we want to limit the amount of La Nina phase that the, uh, that the, the pulse can accumulate inside the, the material. So uh, we set the criteria where the La Nina phase, which is proportional to the, uh, to the care laninearity, the input intensity, and the thickness of the plate to be in the order of pi. When this happens, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we, we set our limit. If we know the thickness of the plate, we then uh, we can put a limit on the intensity. Uh, why is this uh, in the order of pi? So for example here, I use, a, if, if thickness is about 100 microns, uh, your light coming out of the plate is uh, mainly centered in the, in the center. If you, it's 400 microns, which means that the accumulator or linear phase is four times as, as a big, then the light actually is placed off towards the side. So you want to maintain your uh, nonlinear phase to be in the order of pi. The other criteria is how do we determine the spacing between the plates? We say that, okay, um, after coming out of the plate, there's, uh, the beam will focus and then it will expand again. So the intensity of the pulse uh, will go to, go to a very high value. But when it reaches I naught again, okay, I will put, that's where I will want to put the second plate. So we use this as boundary conditions. You can do a simple simulation. And indeed, um, you will find that uh, the intensity or the pulse duration here uh, will vary as a function of the propagation distance. These, notice that these are uh, in the order of uh, millimeters or a few couple of centimeters, okay? The thickness of the plate is only about 100 microns in this uh, simulation. Uh, Within the thickness of the plate, the intensity doesn't change very much. But once coming out of the plate, the intensity, initial intensity is in the order of uh, 20 ter terawatts per square centimeter. When you come out of the plate, there's a, uh, immediately if there's very fast focusing. The intensity can go all the way to higher than 100 terawatts per square centimeter. But then the pulse diffracts, the intensity drops, and then when it reaches the, the initial value, I insert the second plate, and so on. You'll find that uh, the simulation also shows that most of the spectral broadening happens inside the place. 
uh, the propagation in between the plates doesn't cause too much spectral broadening. If you look at the, what's happening inside the plates, this also agrees with the picture. Uh, the pulse temporal shape doesn't really change very much. Most of the changes are in between the plates. On the other hand, the spectrum uh, grows a lot. Indeed, uh, for the first two plates, there's many cell phase modulation, but then uh, Starting with the third plate, you can see this self-steepening. The blue end comes out very quickly. And uh, affiliated with that is a, uh, the pulse uh, intensity change uh, very quickly as a function of time on the edge here. And that's uh, the IDT, which gives you the delta omega change there. Experimentally, this is actually quite simple to set up. Um, Pulse comes in, and then you set up your place and set, determine the spacing between the place. We do this as Brewster angle so that there is no uh, linear loss to the to the uh, pulse energy. And then uh, it, uh, coming out after the, after the place, you can determine the spectrum. You can see here uh, the spectrum. The black curve is the initial spectrum of the laser pulse, and then as you add the number of plates, the spectrum broadens. Uh, over here is mainly cell phase modulation, and then uh, after sufficient, like after the third plate, you can see the blue end uh, extends out, and this is a signature of the generation of supercontinuum. And uh, it's not sufficient just to get a very broad spectrum. Uh, it's also very important that the, the, the spectrum is coherent. Okay, because in, ultimately, if you want a very short pulse, you, you need to have uh, the, the, the entire pulse has to be phase coherent so that you can compress it. And we did the measurements of spatial uh, coherence of the beam is very good. It uh, remains uh, uh, basically coherent throughout the entire, uh, from the blue end to the red end of the spectrum. Longitudinally, it's also very uh, stable and coherent. Now, uh, fine, the experiment was done with about 100 microjoules, but we initially, I said, there's a broad range where it's a void, from 10 microjoules to a, a millijoule. How, so is this approach scalable? Uh, so we have already, in our laboratory, our laser, the maximum energy is in the order of one and a half millijoules, so we show that uh, you can come in with about one, at the maximum energy that is available to us, you can get the same kind of uh, behavior. The overall efficiency of this process is in the order of 50 to 60 percent. That's the, the white circle in the middle. Uh, and that beam has an M square of in the order of 1.2, 1.3 for an input laser that's M square of about 1.2. When the pulse energy goes up, uh, you do need more number of plates to produce the same spectrum. The incident intensity uh, in the order, they are consistently in the order of two to three times 10 to 13 watts per square centimeter. So uh, when we see that the co pulse is co coherent, uh, the next step certainly is you want to uh, do the compression of the pulse. Uh, there are two ways to do it. Uh, either you can set up a uh, 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 safer assisted uh, uh, pulse compressor, and that will com compensate for all the second order and higher order uh, this person that is accumulated by the pulse in propagating uh, from the laser output to the detector. And with this, uh, we have been able to compress the pulse almost to its transform limit. The spectrum we have stretches from about 430 nanometers all the way to beyond 950 nanometers. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, the the uh, transform limited width is about 2.63 femtoseconds. We measure 2.78 femtoseconds using uh, a broadband polarization gated cross frog. Uh, and most of the energy is in the main loop as it's with the transform limit. But of course, the efficiency of a, of a, uh, of a, uh, of a pulse shape is not very good. The overall transmission through the compressor is only about 20%. So if we come in, with a pulse energy of, uh, of about a uh, uh, couple hundred microjoules coming out of the compression, we only get about 20 to 50 microjoules, depending on the input. 
and the peak power is in the order of 10 gigawatts. This is quite sufficient to do extreme nonlinear optics, but it's not quite good enough. The student keeps saying, I want more energy. Another possibility is you can use chirp mirrors. Chirp mirrors are, are very efficient, but they are fixed. Okay, you have to know your spectral phase beforehand, and then uh, you can order your own chirp mirrors, which we did. And with the chirp mirrors, uh, we have compressed our supercontinuum to about three and a half femtoseconds, okay? In this case, because of the coating of the chirp mirror, it cannot cover the entire spectral, spectral width that we have. And uh, we could only get to about, uh, we can, uh, uh, this, the, the transform limit of, of the pulse coming out of the uh, chirp mirrors is in the order of three femtoseconds, and we measure 3.6. But then the throughput is very good, so now we can have peak power in the order of 70 gigawatts from our system. Another way, of course, uh, the best way to measure the width is to use uh, streaking, okay? But we haven't developed a technology yet. But another way of guaranteeing or proving that we do have this kind of peak power is to simply to go ahead and do our linear optics with that, which is, uh, in this case, high harmonic generation. So we set that up, focus the beam, after its compression into a gas cell and then measure the harmonics output. If it is a single isolated pulse, you will get an output spectrum that is broad and continuous. If there are structures in your pulse, okay, if you have a pulse train of several cycles, then you get a, a, a discrete harmonics. So this is what we get when we focus our pulse. We get a continuous spectrum. This is doing it in argon and the peak uh, center around 50 EV. Uh, if you use a uh, long pulse, uh, then you get the discrete harmonics. So this is evidence that the, uh, we got the isolated harmonics. Since the, we have sufficient intensity, we can also do high harmonics in neon, uh, we can, and then uh, that gives us a continuous spectrum uh, all the way up to over 100 EV. Uh, in the laboratory now. Now the advantage of uh, doing this in solids is that it's a very flexible approach. Uh, you can generate, uh, in addition to just one uh, beam of supercontinuum, you can actually have two or three of them lined up very close to each other. And here's an example. Since I'm running out of time, I'm not gonna describe too much of it, but all I would say is we line up two of these uh, supercontinuum cross them and are able to produce circularly polarized high harmonics. Uh, this is the, see, the evidence here is a con fairly continuous spectrum. The top one is a right hand circularly polarized light, bottom one is left hand circularly polarized light in the pulse energy of about 30 to 40 EV. Okay, so, you know, to summarize, uh, we have demonstrated scaling uh, of the multi -conti multi play continuum uh, approach all the way from 10 microjoules to 5 millijoules, covering the range that I have uh, initially described. We also have compressed the pulse and produced in the order of peak power, uh, power, peak power in the order of 100 gigawatts and uh, used that to generate isolated attosecond EUV pulses. Uh, the isolated comes from the fact that the spectrum is continuous, okay? Um, this solution is attractive because using solids, it's stable, it's reliable, and it's simple. So I think we have produced, I've demonstrated to you, and I've convinced you that we now have the solution to cover this void from microjoules to millijoules. Indeed, we have in our laboratory have succeeded to push the maximum pulse energy to beyond uh, five millijoules, okay? This week, the student's gonna be doing five to 10 millijoules. When that's successful, uh, we may one day replace the gas phase approach and stay with, uh, and most people may prefer to use the solids, uh, which will allow us to produce terawatt tabletop uh, pulses. And uh, I think, I hope we have produced a, uh, an alternative tool for uh, doing attosecond science and also attosecond uh, 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 technology. Okay, this work was done mainly by these several students. Uh, he does the supercontinuum experiment. The, he does the simulation <coughs> compression. Is this one here, Bohan? 
Yuchen is now in Enhui's lab. Bohan is in uh, Max Planck Garching, both doing the PhD there. <coughs> and then High Harmonic Generation is by Pei Chi. And I want to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, let's, let's, uh, there's a question or comment, please raise your hand. I, I only have a first question. Sure. Uh, so you, you use an active device or sometimes in the second time is a passive device to actually to compensate, the, uh, to compress the pulse. So right. by, by knowing the active device the information, you, you know the pulse shape itself, right? Uh, without the, even without the street camera, you can, you can retrieve the pulse shape by looking at the compress, compression active device confirmation, right? In the active compression, we are uh, coming out of, of the system. We, we, we have a frog uh, set up. So uh, after each uh, 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 programming of, of the phase that we give the, the compressor, then we check the, the, the uh, pulse width until we get to this point. So, so you, 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 you cannot show us the time, the electric field instead of the intensity profile, electric profile, can, can I show? The electric field, uh, okay. The electric field is basically, uh, okay, um, the question is how, how re reliable, oops, how, how reliable uh, the, the, the frog, frog reconstruction is, right? Um, we do not show the electric field because we do not know what is the carrier envelope phase. If we assume the phase is zero, then uh, you, you get, basically for this width, is you get about a 1.1, uh, psycho pulse. Mm -hmm. but, but, but you, you have used the uh, uh, SLM uh -huh. to, to compress. Right. Well, that still depends on your input uh, carrier envelope phase. It only compresses it, it compress the, the, the relative phase of the pulse, but the, you cannot tell what your absolute phase is. Okay, okay. Uh, is there another question? from the audience. Uh, if not, then let's thank the speaker again and let's move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuhn. Thank you. Okay, so next speaker of this session is uh, uh, J.V. Porto from Joint Quantum Institute, University of Maryland, Gettysburg, USA. The title of this talk is spontaneous broadening of a driven dissipative readback system 